Yes. Happy New Year. Happy Lunar New Year, everyone. So, Happy New Year. You know, a legend that I heard when I was a kid was year was actually originally a uh, year in Chinese is Nian. Originally was the name of a monster that uh, likes to come and harm people once every 12 months on New Year's Eve. And that's why people need to go home uh, with their families. The families have to gather and uh, do activities that make a lot of noise like drinking and gambling, especially gambling. The favorite uh, game is, is uh, dice, uh, throwing the dice in the ceramic bowl because that makes a lot of noise. So anything that makes a lot of noise is good, helps uh, keep the, the monster away. And then that's why we all have to stay up at least till midnight. Oh, of course, uh, most important thing is firecracker is very important, helps keep the monster away. And then we all have to stay up till midnight to make sure you know we're on, on the night watch, uh, that we're ready if the monster comes. And then at the strike of midnight, you hang up these uh, big long dragon firecrackers and set them off. Cause that's uh, the midnight is the most dangerous time where, as far as the monster, uh, when, when that monster likes to come. And then uh, right after midnight, we're all safe. And that's, uh, so New Year's Eve is a time for families. And then New Year's Day is a time for uh, friends and neighbors. So once you get past midnight, you start uh, uh, greeting your neighbors and, uh, you know, we're already out in front of our doors with the firecrackers. And as soon as that's done, you congratulate everyone. You say, gong xi, gong xi. Uh, which makes sense in this context. I, why do you say gong xi, which means congratulations? Uh, it's, we don't say, yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I think it's because congratulations, we all survived the year. The monster didn't come and we're still alive. So anyway, just to share, share uh, some old story that I heard when I was a kid. It kind of explains, uh, brings a lot of these traditions in one nugget. Nice story. <laughs> and also Chinese New Year is really a 15 day period. The New Year, uh, the Lunar New Year is always on a new moon. And then the next major holiday is the Lantern Festival, which is the first full moon. So between new moon and full moon is 15 days. And this, this whole period is considered the, the new year holiday season. All right, enough of that. Uh, let's get into our real business here. And so uh, Jason had a great suggestion since this is New Year's Eve. And actually in Taiwan, it's already the new year. We start, we do a uh, reading on the first uh, hexagram, or well, the first chapter of Yi Jin. So first I'll give uh, a little background and then we'll do some reading together. And this time, so the, the, the reading, I'm basically gonna, the Yi Jin, the original text is really concise. So basically I'll teach everyone how to read Chinese. So, so we're all on equal footing. And, uh, and we dive uh, deep into the meaning of, uh, of each, each character. And then we open up for discussion. So first a little background about Yi Jin. So according to old legend, uh, we had the five sages, uh, I'm sorry, the three, the three sage kings period. Those were prehistoric times. And two of the very prominent ones were Nuwa and Fuxi. And according to legend, they were either uh, sister and brothers or wife or husband, or even according to some versions of both. So you go figure. And so Nuwa was very important because she saved earth by mending heaven. 
And Fu Xi was the, a great inventor, he invented a lot of things, including uh, music, domestication of animals, and also very importantly, the eight trigrams, which is was supposed to be really the origin of uh, aging. And how did he come up with these eight trigrams? He spent a lot of time observing nature around him and thinking about nature, how nature works. And he abstracted his observations into eight symbols. Each symbol has three lines and a continuous line can, uh, represented, re represents the yang energy, the, the positive energy, if you will. And the, the broken lines represent the yin energy. And, um, and if you take the combination, all possible combinations of three broken and continuous lines, you get eight symbols. And these symbols from the left to right symbolize heaven, marsh, fire, wind, water, mountain, thunder, and earth. So just to digress a little bit, uh, I'd like to share the legend about Niwa because it's really one of my favorite legends. So even though it's not related to our topic at all, uh, I just want to share with it as an interesting story. So how did Nuwa save the earth, you might ask? Well, according to one book, Huanzi, that going back to more ancient times, the four pillars which propped up heaven were, bro were broken. The nine provinces were in tatters. Heaven did not, complete, did not completely cover the earth and earth did not hold up heaven all the way around. Fires blazed out of control and could not be extinguished. Water flooded in great expanses and could not recede. Ferocious animals ate blameless people. Predatory birds snatched the elderly and the weak. Thereupon, Niwa smelted together five colored stones in order to patch up the uh, azure sky cut off the legs of the great turtle to set them up as the four pillars, killed the black dragon to provide relief for Jizhou, which is one of the provinces, and piled up reeds and cinders to stop the surging waters. The azure sky was patched, the four pillars were set up, the surging waters were drained, the province of Ji was tranquil, crafty vermin died off, and blameless people preserve their lives. Okay, so going back to our main topic here, Yijin. So in the beginning, there were the eight symbols, each one of the three lines. And then if you take combinations of the eight symbols and stack them up into symbols of six lines, <coughs> mathematically you get 64 possible combinations. So you get 64 symbols. And here is a table of all the symbols, their names in Chinese and English, and kind of a one word translation of what the names mean. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell on this. This is something uh, everyone can look up and, and study on their own. So Yi Jin is a book that basically has a chapter on each symbol and what, how to interpret the symbols. So that's essentially what Yi Jin is. Think of it as kind of a, originally it may have been a, a div, um, divina, divinator's reference book and uh, were, uh, you, you go through the divination process and that process produces a, a result of which symbols you should look up. And then you look up those symbols and you interpret the text. So 
But today, I'm not gonna talk about divination uh, at all. I'm gonna focus on Yi Jing as a book of philosophy. Um, but if you're only interested in Yi Jing as a book of divination, this uh, discussion is still important because you can't really interpret the results unless you first understood the philosophy in Yi Jing. So just a, a few interesting sidebars as far as more modern influences or maybe coincidental connections with Yi Jing. So the German polymath Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz really admired each, the philosophies of Yi Jing. And uh, if, for those of you who are into math and computers, it's pretty apparent that Yi Jing is, the symbols are basically zeros and ones. Um, and you it's, it's founded on a, a binary number system. So it actually in, inspired Leibniz to invent the binary number system on which all digital technology today is based. Uh, Carl Jung, uh, from a different perspective, was deeply influenced by Yi Jing, and uh, this inspired him to formulate his synchronicity concept. And uh, I won't get into the details of this, but mathematically, you can actually also draw a one-to-one -one correspondence between um, how genetic coding works in DNAs and RNAs in nature and, and the mathematics of EG. I see Madeline has a hand, has a hand up. Go, go ahead. Yes, thanks, Pin. Uh, this is beautifully structured. I just have to come in with uh, an interesting factoid. Um, I think as many people here know, um, both Nu Wa and Fu Shi, um, are often represented as uh, people who have a snake as the lower half of their body. And so I'm currently reading Ovid in another group, and there is a huge amount of snake person and snake mythology in the ancient Greeks, mm. which makes me think it's extremely old. And it's very interesting because the... Um, the character for Nu Wa in Chinese is a special character. Um, it contains a radical, I think that's just hers. And anyway, the part of the character is a, I think a set of little boxes that means um, <clears throat> a spiral. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, and Yeah, I'm going to give up for a minute. Uh, anyway, it relates to the DNA thing. Oh, oh, the double helix. Well, very, very interesting thoughts. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, you see on the figure on this uh, on the right here, uh, Niwa and Fushi both have these uh, snake-like lower bodies. And uh, you're right. The the character. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I'm, I'm circling around the character you're talking about. On the left side, it's a radical that means woman. Uh, on the right side is a radical that's also used in, in, in the radical for snail. So that spiral, if you look at the shell of a snail, that spiral pattern. And also, you know, the, the Chinese dragon is described as uh, having scales. So it's also a, a the body of the dragon is snake-like, is, uh, is a reptile body. Um, and really the dragon is a, a amalgamation of different animals. Uh, the, the, the antlers are deer-like and uh, also it's also fish-like. Uh, so, one theory is that maybe the dragons symbolize different tribes that formed the alliance in prehistoric times. Hmm. I know in um, in the in the ancient Greek and Roman mythology, the words snake and dragon are used interchangeably. 
And they really are mostly talking about snake, sometimes with legs, sometimes they pull a chariot and they fly. Uh, so it's quite different from the Chinese dragon, which can take many forms. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The dragon is almost uh, kind of a, a unfortunate transmission because I think in the West, the dragon is associated more with fire and also as a scary animal. Whereas uh, in the Chinese tradition, a dragon is a very auspicious symbol and also more associated with making rain and water. <clears throat> Okay, so back back to Yijin. So when we talk about the Yijin that we wrote, we, we read today, who, who wrote it? Uh, uh, and uh, so, as I said, it's a book for interpreting this, the hexagrams. Uh, and we know from historical accounts that there once were three three different books all uh uh represent maybe three different schools of interpreting these hexagrams there was a lian shan yi which lian shan man means uh, connected mountain gui chang yi gui chang means to uh return and into hiding and then there's Zhou Yi. So only one, the last one survives till today. So when we talk about Yi Jin today, it's, it's Zhou Yi. So why is it called Zhou Yi? Well, Zhou is the name of a, a state that later became a dynasty. And, and Confucius and many other great philosophers of Chinese history lived in the Zhou dynasty. So why is it named after this, this feudal state and later dynasty? Uh, well, it's because uh, according to history that this book was written by King Wen of Zhou. Uh, he was the king of Zhou when actually he was really, when he was still posthumously, he was uh, named the king. But during his lifetime, he was a count of a few, the feudal state Zhou in the Song Dynasty, and uh, he became his state became too strong, and uh, the Song uh, King didn't like that. So, so the Song King put him uh, into prison. So he was basically a political prisoner. So while he was a prisoner, uh, he had a lot of time to think about life, and he wrote this book, and then. Today, in addition to the original text, there's a lot of annotations purportedly written by Confucius. And uh, of course that could be true, but it could also be true that uh, his students wrote it. Certainly there are passages that said, the master said, so on and so forth. It certainly seemed like it, his students wrote it. Uh, I don't think Confucius would write it himself and say the master said. And these uh, 10 wings basically are, think of them as sort of 10 books, 10 booklets, each one uh, offering a somewhat different perspective of the meaning of the original text of Yi Jin. And so what does Yi mean? Yi, the character in Chinese can mean either change or easy. So, uh, so I like the English transition of, uh, translation of the Book of Change. And just an aside, Confucius uh, famously said, give me several additional years, I will use that to study aging from the age of 50. From that, I can avoid making major errors. So Confucius himself uh, greatly valued aging and considered him a student of Yi Jin. And also if, uh, for those of you who are more interested in the divination, how that was done and whatnot, uh, last year I gave a presentation. So that, uh, thanks to Jason, that the, the recording is uploaded on YouTube. 
uh, here's the link, but you don't have to copy it. Uh, at all of the JSON's meeting uh, announcements, there's a link that if you click it, it takes you to a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet basically archives, lists all the past uh, meetups that we've had. And, and in that list, there's also for each one, there's a link to a YouTube recording. All right. So anyway, now we know a little bit of the background of each and let's just jump in and, and, uh, and do the reading. Okay, first passage, uh, first read in Chinese. You see how concise it is. First section, just five characters. Qian, Yuan, Hen, Li, Zhen. So basically this is, if you will, whoever wrote Yi Jin, it's kind of like, how do I describe the first symbol in four words? And this is it. So first of all, Qian is the name of this hexagram. And in the little pictures, I list the, the oldest writing form I can find in Chinese of, of, of that character. Uh, of course, Chinese writing was not unified until the first emperor. So for each character, there were different ways to write it. And I, the reason why I do this is Chinese language, uh, written language, it's, uh, as you all know, it's not a phonetic language. It's, um, it has a lot of pictographic content in it. So the symbols themselves that, that were written, they carry meaning. So when we, in my opinion, when we read, read a book that was written close to 3000 years ago, uh, you know, we can't just take the modern meaning of the words and say that we are sure we, under, we got the right meaning because language evolves over time. So it's nice to go back and look at the, the ancient symbols in their most ancient forms and try to decipher what it could have meant 3,000 years ago. So Qian, what is, what is a symbol? So we see that there is a symbol for the sun. That's the circle with a dot in it. And uh, so I, these interpretations are from dictionaries. So they're, they're not my, just my ideas. So the symbol symbolize the rising air. You see these wiggling lines. So there's a rising air due to energy from the morning sun. Cause the symbol in the center, it, it symbolizes the sun. And then you have these, this part that looks like a tree. So this is in the morning when the sun is still kind of behind the trees, just rising. And then on the left and right, you have these, uh, these wiggly lines uh, symbolizing the, uh, the, the, the rising air. So this, this is, this is the basic essence of this, um, of this qian, is, is an energy. It's the, the energy of the sun. And it's the energy that drives things to rise. And another interpretation is also, uh, it also has symbolizes plants breaking the ground and growing out of the ground. So this is the, a, a primal energy in nature that make things live and thrive. Okay, so that's the name. And it says, Qian is, symbol, its significance is Yuan Hen Li Zhen. So Yuan, what's Yuan? You look at this ancient symbol here. The lower part symbolizes a person. You see the leg, the rear end here, and, and the hand kind of dangling down. And then the, the upper line, lines here symbolize what's above the head of the person. So its meaning is the beginning and the head, and also has an abstract meaning. This way, a lot of times when you see just in Chinese character, just a, a line above, it, it means something abstract. So this is like the universe that's above the human. And Hen, okay, Hen, you look at the, 
the ancient form, it looks like a shrine. So it symbolizes uh, the, the offering of, to our ancestors uh, for, for their blessing. So the modern meaning, I think maybe one, one word, I, somehow the word Godspeed came, comes to mind. The modern meaning we use as saying, you know, when something goes really well, we just accomplish, there's no obstruction, it just goes right through. So this is, um, that's a modern meaning, okay. So I think originally it probably came from, we, we, we offer and we respect our ancestors and the blessings from our ancestors enable us to accomplish things uh, smoothly and in a facile way. And Li, so Li the symbol is on the left again, it's, it's a plant, it's, uh, it's the rice plant and with this thing dangling, that's the rice that's already bearing grains. So probably in the late summer, uh, early autumn. And then on the right side is a, uh, a sickle tool. So it has a long handle and a curved blade for harvesting the rice. So Li, um, modern meaning is, is not too far away from the symbol. It means sharp, beneficial, or profit. So it's a symbol of harvest. And Zhen, okay. The, <clears throat> the symbol in the ancient form is, is a, the bronze cauldron. Uh, on the upper right-hand side, I have a picture of a bronze cauldron from about 3000 years ago. And uh, it's beautiful, beautiful bronze. And this also, as you can see, the, 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 all the bronze cauldrons that we see today are very ornate and just amazing craftsmanship and artistic design. It was, uh, was a symbol, also a symbol of state power. And, and also these things were really heavy, not easily moved. So the modern meaning is unmoving commitment or loyalty. It's also, uh, uh, another meaning is chastity. So, okay. So this opening section here is basically explained. These are the characters of Qian, the most essential characters. Okay. Then Yijin gets into interpretations of each line, starting from the bottom line. And Qian is very simple. All the lines are the same. It's all the same symbol, the yang, the yang energy symbol. So it says, initial line. So I basically, I'm translating everything as literally as possible at the sacrifice of elegance or, uh, or easy for comprehension. Okay, so initial nine. Okay, what does that mean? Initial means this initial, this lowest position here. Nine is what Yi Jin used to, to refer to the, the, the yang line, the, the, the continuous line. And they use the six to represent, to refer to the broken line, the yin line, okay. So initial nine just means the first continuous line. And, and it says, what, is that, what does this line uh, signify? It says, submerged dragon does not apply itself. So basically I'm doing a character by character translation, more or less, okay? So that's what it says. And so I could, as you can see, See, the, the, the writing is extremely parsimonious. Uh, the words themselves are not that hard to understand on the surface, but the interpretation, what does this really mean, is pretty obscure, right? And uh, so, so I'm just gonna go through this. Don't try, to <laughs> Don't try too hard to understand it the uh, in this first reading. And then we're gonna, we're gonna uh, as a group, 
discuss our own interpretations. What anything we get out of this, and how how do we interpret this as individuals? And also, I at the end I have a collection of Confucius's interpretations. So when we're interested, we can also have Confucius as our esteemed uh, facilitator or assistant here for our discussion. So again, look looking deep into the language. I see two hands up. Uh, once I finish this start, slide, I'll, I'll pause for questions. It says submerged dragon. So what's what is dragon? Okay, dragon is the the ancient form again. Here the picture. You see basically a long body um, critter here. And so the there is the the first dictionary ever written in Chinese was in AD 121 by uh, the great scholar Xu Shen. So let's see how he defined it. He said, it's the greatest of all critters with scales, can hide and can reveal itself, can become minuscule or giant, can become short or long, rises to the sky at vernal equinox, submerges into deep bodies of water at autumnal equinox. So that's what, uh, that's, that's what long or dragon was. Again, I'm not, I'm gonna refrain from my own interpretations because I wanna give everyone the freedom for your, your own interpretations. And so, and then submerged dragon does not, and then the, the last word is a little bit difficult to translate. Does not, I, I translate it as does not apply itself. So what is this character? Again, I, I wanna teach you how to read Chinese so we're on equal footing, okay? And um, cause your interpretation is, is as good as mine. So this symbol basically, it symbolizes a, a bucket. And the modern meaning is to use. Basically the, uh, the interpretation is that the original character meant a bucket meaning something that you use, you utilize. So, uh, so, okay, submerged dragon does not apply itself, okay? And the second here, uh, interpretation of the second line. So second line, so the second uh, continuous line. Sea dragon at the farm field, beneficial to see great person. And then moving on the third line, third nine, the virtuous person all day, qian qian. Qian, uh, I, I, I didn't translate this uh, into English. Qian is the same character as the name of the, the symbol. So, so it symbolizes uh, this uh, energy, this uh, solar-like energy that keeps things, that, that make things grow, okay? So the virtuous person all day is applying this kind of energy or has this kind of energy. Evening cautious as such. So this even in the evening, uh, the person remains cautious in the same way. Rough situation, no disaster. So basically if you, so you, you start to see a pattern here. It describes, the first sentence describes what you do. Second sentence describes the situation. And the third, the final part describes set, uh, the outcome. So basically, you, if you keep on, on bar, keep your energy going and uh, be cautious, uh, you're in this rough situation, but there's no disaster. Okay, you can avoid disaster. So a couple of characters here that um, worth looking more into. So what, what's this rough situation as I translate it? So in Chinese is Li. And these are a couple of the original forms. You see on the left-hand side is the, is the pictograph for a scorpion. And on the right-hand side, the interpretation is that this, uh, 
this bracket-like line on the upper left represents a, a cliff or rocks. And then the, you see this uh, scorpion-like thing again, uh, but with some symbol of a tool. So basically, you know, this is a little bit hard for me to follow, but the dictionary say it symbolizes a, a sharpening stone. So basically a rough piece of rock that grinds other things. So the modern meaning in today's language, it means severe fears or to grind something into shape. So basically you're, it, you're in a rough situation, okay? It's gonna grind you. It's gonna shape your character. It's gonna wear you down. But as long as you remain, keep your energy and remain cautious, uh, it won't be disastrous. And this very last character uh, that I translate as disaster, quoting uh, that's based on, again, Xu Shen's uh, definition. And now we're on to the fourth line. Fourth line, maybe jump into the deep body of water, no disaster. Okay, so jump in, dive in, and uh, it's not gonna be a disaster. You'll be okay, basically. Um, fifth nine, now we're, we're getting to the, the, the line that's right, right below the top. And oftentimes in most of these symbols, that's, that's the best position. So fifth nine, flying dragon in the sky, beneficial to see great person. And then now we're at the top line, top nine, high or arrogant dragon has regret. So this first uh, character here, I obviously had a little hard time deciding how to translate it. So you look at the ancient symbol, it, it looks like a very, very tall person. Uh, symbolizes a person with a very long neck. So symbolizes high and also arrogant. And then, so now we've gone through the six, six lines. Now for only the first two chapters, for Qian and for Quan, there is an additional line, uh, part that's called, that basically is uh, kind of like, you're not in any one of these situations anymore. You're not bound inside these situations. You are the position where you can see the, you can see all situations as a whole, okay? So it says, and this use nine, okay? So this use is very difficult to interpret, but my interpretation is that, again, you're not in this situation anymore. You're more in the driver's seat, okay? So you're using, now you're using the situation. Uh, use nine, see group of dragons, no head with no head, auspicious, it's a good thing. So what, what is this head here? It's also a character kind of hard, you know, could have different meanings and whatnot. So the original symbol, you see this giant eye with some eyelashes. So it symbolizes the head of a, either a, of an animal, including a human, uh, with an emphasis on the, on the eye. And the modern meaning we use it, it's a very common character. We use it to refer to a leader or something of that's of primary importance. So from the symbol, I think you can see it's the head, but the eye, the, it's a vision, okay? It's not just the head, the physical head. It's also a head that's associated with vision. So a visionary, a leader. So, okay. So let's let's put all them together here. And so Qian is the beginning. It signifies Godspeed, beneficial and unmoving commitment. In the lowest uh, line, the significance uh, is submerged dragon does not apply itself. The second line, you see dragon at the farm field, 
beneficial to see great person. Uh, next one up, the virtuous person all day, qian qian, evening cautious as such. Rough situation, no disaster. Fourth nine, perhaps jump into the deep body water, no disaster. And fifth nine, flying dragon in the sky, beneficial to see great person. Top nine, high arrogant dragon has regret. Use nine, see group of dragons, no head, auspicious. So one pattern is pretty obvious. The dragon keeps going up and up. First one is submerged. Second one is kind of on the ground, not totally exposed. It's in the rice field. If you uh, know rice fields, they're, they're kind of like pools, okay? They're, they're a little bit uh, dug down in the ground with filled with water. So you're basically the dragon is in some shallow water. Uh, the next one doesn't have dragon, but you get to the fifth, the dragon now is flying in the sky. And then the, the last one, the top, top line, the dragon is now too high. It's, it has regrets. And then use nine, you're not in any of this situation. No, you're actually an observer. You can see. You're not inside the circle anymore. Kind of remember Zhuangzi's, uh, well, let's not get into Zhuangzi, but you're not in the circle anymore. You're, you're outside the circle and you can see a whole group of dragons, all right? So this, this last one, I would say for, for everyone, whether you read Chinese or not, is, the most uh, controversial, that is very hard to interpret, very hard to understand. There are a lot of different interpretations. Uh, see a group of dragons, see a group of dragons, no head, auspicious. Well, I'll just share a quote from Lao Tzu. The best leader is one whose existence is not even recognized. Next best, adored and praised. Next, feared. Next, subordinates are insulted. Insufficient trust and there is no trust. Leisurely, words are used, spare, are, are used preciously. When success comes and tasks completed, people say, I did it naturally. So the, this is, uh, we can probably relate that even to our, our own lives. Uh, the best kinds of leaders are the ones that you don't even know they exist because things just work. Uh, at the end, when things are accomplished, you feel like you did it yourself. You, you're really proud of it and you did a great job. You don't feel like someone was holding your hands or breathing down your neck uh, and that's how you got it done. And, uh, and that's more than just with being a leader. Uh, let's say, we draw the analogy of you're, you're someone in charge of, let's say, uh, event organization or logistics, right? I think the best kind is if you know you've done your job perfectly is uh, the people who are in the event don't even know you exist. Everything is just there. Whatever they need, it's just there. You know, they don't even need to know that you exist. That's the best kind. And then the next, next best one is people come to you for, for problems and you help them and they love you because you're so pleasant, you're so helpful, you're, you're adored and praised. But at the same time, the fact that people have to constantly come to you for help, maybe that already in the self is an imperfection, right? Because uh, maybe the system can be made better. And then of course the next, is that uh, you have to have in, uh, you motivate people who work for you uh, using fear pack tactics that they do it because they're afraid of you. They're afraid that you're going to do something to them if they where they will be punished uh, somehow. And then the of course the, then the next is that you're literally you're there yelling and shouting and insulting people to get them to 
to get the job done. Uh, kind of the uh, so so that's that's kind of my interpretation of this C group of dragons no head auspicious. Um, so actually, at this time, I'll open. Uh, the discussion for everyone and and if you want, I think I'd like to just leave it at, as is right now, even though this is very terse because so that I'm not tainting everyone with with uh, with other people's interpretations. Uh, other people meaning I have a collection of, uh, what Confucius wrote, and uh, but whenever uh, anyone wants to see Confucius's interpretation, ask me, and I'll go to the corresponding sections to see what Confucius thought about this. But uh, but anyway, yeah. So that's it. Thanks everyone for your attention. But let's uh, now let's open up for the group. Okay, yeah, sorry, uh, I will go. There's lots of hands up, which is awesome. And I'll go in the order that appears on my screen. Uh, James, and then CK. All right, uh, yeah, uh, Jason waited longer time though than I did. He, his, his oh, 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 I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jason yeah. first, yeah, thank you, thank you. That's fine, Bill, I have a black hand, so you probably cannot see it. So. And now, yeah, now I recognize it, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> no, uh, uh, I, I just like to talk about like, it's very interesting on the uh, very first slide, right? The Qian, Yuan, Heng, Li, Zhen, okay, these four words. Uh, 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 if you know that the quantum computing company in China and which was run by Baidu, uh, the name is the Qian Shi, okay? So a lot, a lot of times do not know why the Qian Shi, why they call this name? They mean beginning of Qian. So it sounds very ambitious. Okay, I just want to mention this one because that Qian means heaven, means the beginning and the beginning of beginning. So uh, the company name means Qian Shi. So that's what they mean. Second word, Yuan, right? Uh, the, uh, if you're familiar with the Chinese history, uh, Yuan is the dynasty, the name of the dynasty from Mongolia. So uh, I think that's always very funny because they want to uh, pick up the name for their dynasty. So they pick up the uh, the book of change, okay, the Yi Jing, and they find the first interpretation, which is Yuan. Okay, so great. That's the uh, our dynasty's name. So I think these four words you know, is very important. And then you can see these four words are all good words okay, in uh, Chinese. And uh, you can use these four words. All you want to say five words you, know, you can use for your name. If you want to pick a Chinese name for your, 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 your kids, okay, uh, you pick one of these, uh, any one of these four words is nothing wrong. You know? So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jason. James? Yeah, I, uh, I'm really impressed. I, I uh, never have read this book and this is so wonderful. Um, I like, uh, I certainly like this uh, hexagram. Uh, the, uh, it sounds like power. It sounds like um, uh, the road to success. It sounds like um, unobstructed um, proper uh, comportment. Uh, having having great mentors, uh, you know the the, the dragon. I, I mean, I, I I've never really understood the dragon very much as a Westerner. I, you know, it's in other words, I understand it as fun. I've always in the past, I've always understood it as children playing in the streets and fun and gestures and you know that sort of thing. But what uh, and the idea of like uh, uh, pleasure with 
danger with implied danger kind of idea, you know, but it's, I'm, I'm beginning to understand here that it means power too, not just power, not just a scary critter, but a, but power to the individual. I see this as uh, the, the, this whole story as a story of uh, stability and power. Am I, do you think I'm far off, Pin? Oh, personally, my, my interpretations are very similar to yours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right on, yeah. Thank you. Uh, CK. Yes, I just like to make a comment about the word E. Uh, I mean, Pin, you mentioned that there are two translations in English, um, change or easiness, if I'm not wrong. There is a third meaning, meaning exchange, exchange, which, which is E, which probably doesn't apply in the context that is being used here. But that is also one of the meanings. So I thought I would just mention it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that could be applicable here too, because you know, in the divination, there's a lot of, you change the lines and uh, so, um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, well, thank, thank you for sharing that. And uh, next is uh, Quan Li, D did I pronounce your name correctly? Uh, perfectly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so my question is uh, about the 10 winds, okay, the Shu Yi is traditionally attributed to Confucius. According to what you know of the scholarship on that matter, is that attribution quite serious or we have to consider it as a collective work spanning many generations and credited to Confucius? Yeah, I would say most scholars uh, believe what you just said. It's a, see it as an anthology of the Confucianist school of interpretation that's written, maybe some of it was written by Confucius himself, some of it by his students. And right, like you said, probably spanning generations. Although, you know, there's no hard evidence for any of the, uh, but, it's just from the, the text itself, it seems like it's written, not written by one person, just the, the writing style. Uh, different parts have different styles of writing. Some of it is very terse, uh, very concise. Some of it, uh, there are other wings that are much wordier. So it seems like different styles of writing indicating probably different people. And also there, there's parts uh, where it said it's, says it poses a question and then it said the master said and whenever i see the master said I, I i take it as you know a student or someone later person wrote that uh perhaps from the their recollection of direct conversations with confucius but not written by confucius himself yeah. okay and, thank you uh, i just have a little uh, second question but it will be short as you know, the Principality of Lu has been destroyed in 249 BCE. If we take the Shu Yi as being the interpretation by the Confucian school, let's say between 479 BCE to 249 BCE, what the received text that we have of the Shu Yi, the final version, is it the version of 249 BCE or there have been addition or subtraction during the Han Imperial Dynasty. And the received text that we have now is more from that period. Do you have uh, some scholarship going in that direction? Yeah, great question. Um, the, okay, so generally with these ancient Chinese classic text, uh, Confucianist, you know, these sacred, uh, if you will, texts, uh, as you said, uh, they've been burned by first by uh, the first emperor and then by Xiang Yu. Mm. So there's uh, commonly there's a great fight 
since the Han Dynasty between different scholars. There's the Jingwen, which means modern text. And then there's a Gu Wen, which means ancient text. So how did this split come from? So the, okay. So after the burning of books, uh, there are scholars uh, in the early Han Dynasty who had memorized these classic classical texts. And uh, as you know, the, the, that's the old way of learning. You memorize the, the books. So it's not surprising. There are a lot of people who had these texts memorized. And then they secretly, from memory, with their students, reproduced uh, these ancient classics. So that's called the modern version. And then at a certain year in the Han Dynasty, uh, there's a scholar, an official, a scholar official of the dynasty who went to the state of Lu. Well, well he was a governor of the, the province of Lu. And he claimed that in the process of um, retrofitting the, the, the original residence of Confucius, he discovered all these books inside the walls of, the, of Confucius' residence. And uh, so he, and so he's, you know, what a great archeological discovery. He discovered all these, all the, all the, all the ancient uh, texts. Well, maybe not all, but a lot of it. So he claims this was the real thing before the burning. But even the scholars at that time, also many, many scholars till today, uh, suspect that he actually forged those texts. Uh, so, okay, so anyway, sorry, I, I gave a really long answer, but the, I believe, I'm not certain, but I believe that the, what we read today is the modern version, is the version written down from memory. Uh, okay. Because scholars uh, through history, most scholars trust, trust the, the, mod, called the modern version uh, more. Yeah, they, they trust more the memory of the ancient scholars. Yeah, yeah. Instead of this one person who claimed that he made this great discovery, and uh, yeah, a lot of people thought that he was a. Uh, I forgot his name. Do you do you remember his name? Uh, oh, but it's a detail. I can check it. Uh, I. Uh, he, he, is Wilson? he? Lucian? Is Liu Xin the person? Liu Xin, yeah, Liu Xin. Yeah, yeah, thank Lucian. you. Okay, the Imperial yeah. Librarian. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I, by the way, I'm not against long answers, on the contrary. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, James and then Pe Penny. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, <clears throat> you said that uh, this is, uh, the I Ching represents a kind of a philosophy. Is a philosophy closer to, um, how Confucius defines defines that uh, you know interprets that philosophy, or is it, or does it have uh, also the the uh, does it also lean towards uh, Taoism? Uh, because it's a book of changes, so it's it means that it's a uh, there's it it's a process, right? It's a process of of change. Situations change. And no situation is the same. And so it seems to be like, like a philosophy of becoming, but then it has a limited number of, um, of interpretations of what uh, each um, state of becoming is, right? Um, so there's, uh, there's 64 ways to interpret your situation, right? So, so that means that you know, there's a kind of a philosophy of being there that there, that's the way things are, you know, and, and but then it's subject to change, and it's a uh, those those states of being are limited to sixty four. Is 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 that right? Because Confucius would be probably interpreting it uh, in that way, and maybe a Taoist might be inter might interpret it a different way, more in a, in a, in in a state of flux, that the uh, the cosmology or the metaphysics or the ontology is in a state of flux? Yeah, great question. So the answer is both. Um, I think once I saw on, in the online Britannica Encyclopedia of Chinese history, it has this line that said, 
all ancient Chinese philosophies traces its roots to the Yijin or something like that, where the Yijin is the mother of all ancient Chinese philosophy. There's, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. So first of all, uh, I, I subscribe to one histor a, a historical account and a school of view that Confucius was Laozi's student. And uh, so in the beginning, there really was only, if you will, Taoism. Um, so both, uh, so Yijin, both Taoists and Confucianists see themselves as students uh, of, of Yijin. Uh, obviously, I, I already called it Confucius and he, he and his students wrote the 10 wins. wins and, uh, uh, but Taoism is, uh, as you refer to the, Taoist philosophy is very much influenced by Yi Jing as well. And you, you even read the text and you, even when you read the, the Confucianist Ten Wings, you see a lot of language that's actually very similar to, to the book uh, Dao De Jin, uh, of the, you know, the, the um, Lao Zi's uh, book. Uh, did I answer your question? James? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, so um, because um, the uh, Carl Jung probably, uh, you know, interpreted each of those uh, 64 as archetypes, right? And so, um, so there's a kind of a limited way of uh, understanding this, uh, this um, kind of, of um, you know, idea of change, right? There's a limit to change, right? There <laughs> And the archetypes is is that limit, right? But there are philosophers who say there is no limit to that that uh, the number of archetypes or to to this process of change. Right? I think uh, Confucius would say maybe there's uh, even a quote from Confucius that the change is infinite, but you have to stop at some point, right? You start with eight symbols and then sixty four, and then you can go up and up, you know, 128, all the powers are two. Uh -huh. But 64 is a kind of a good stopping point. It's already a lot. Most people can't handle anything more than 64. And it, it's enough of a concept, conceptual granulation to, to, for, to inspire you to deal with most, most, most every, all situations in life. Right, right. Yeah. Of course, if there are, uh, if those 64 correspond to the, um, the uh, complexities of our DNA, mm -hmm. then there's a limit to to our character, to who um, how we understand ourselves. Maybe, yeah. But yeah, so so there's a yeah there's it just means that there's a potential for you know for for infinite uh, possibilities, right? Right, right. Yeah. That. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Pat. Penny, uh, do I pronounce your name correctly? Yes. Yeah, I was just, um, I mean, when, I, when we were, when you were reading it and we were thinking about it, to me, it also seemed like the, this, um, it was showing kind of like something like an opportunity or a potential. And at first, you know, it's completely hidden. But then it starts to kind of be visible. And then the person, though, doesn't do anything yet. He's cautious. He waits and um, till like, you know, the right time. And then he does decide to move into this new area, you know, the deep body of water that you can't really see in. But it's a good time. You know, it wasn't disastrous, and so it it worked out very well. It was, you know, very beneficial then. Um, so that's that's kind of it. Just seemed to me it might be something like that. Yeah, I agree. That I have to say, I personally throughout my life, I often draw upon this chapter uh, with, with the kind of perspective that, that you just offer and, and also what, what James said earlier as well. Uh, about mentors, about 
different stages of, let's say, your career, your a project that you turn, uh, you're taking on, you know, something like that. It's just any kind of a endeavor or enterprise, and there there are different stages. And what what are the generally benef- good things to do? And and like you said, you know, jump jump into the deep body water. And in our modern day language, it might be you know, get out of your com- comfort zone. Uh, uh, dive in, or or uh, or stretch yourself, set stretch goals, uh, whatever. And um, yes, and Madeline, Jason, and then uh, and Joseph. Yes. So uh, this is just a quick question, Pin. The characters for uh, Rice Field and Marsh. Are they related to each other in any way? Uh, no, uh, not not at least not to my knowledge. Uh, oh, the rice field, yeah, the rice field. Um, I'll show you the character. Uh, sorry. So that's if you can see my cursor. It, it's a it's a square with with a cross inside. So if you've seen the rice field. It looks from above. It looks very much like that. Um, so that's just a kind of a drawing of the shape, uh, a bird's okay. eye view. And uh, one for the marsh is basically on the left side. There's a radical for water, and uh, on the right hand side is quite complicated. I think it's it probably symbolizes all the different things, uh, plants and animals that plants that grow in a marsh and and um, and the animals that go there to eat and, and drink water and rest. So the marsh is a very, uh, that symbol symbolizes like uh, the nurturing of nature. Okay, uh, I think Jason and Joseph. Yeah, I did like a kind of the respond to James uh, 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 comment uh, on the change, right? So I think that's another way to interpret. Right? If you take as a Confucian school's uh, <clears throat> interpretation, e uh, the change could be like uh, just like a pin said, okay, sixty four is enough. That's the limited change, and uh, all you want to take, oh, they have an unlimited change. But if we take as a Taoism interpretation, right? That you, you that's why the E also means easy because there's many many changes, and the, the even if they have unlimited number of changes, they have the easy way to understand the Tao, which is unchanged behind that. So that's another way to interpret uh, the meaning of uh, change here and how we uh, related to the change and uh, easy. And then they have another meaning of uh, uh, is uh, unchanged, right? So that means a constant doubt behind it. So that, that's just another way to look at it. Yeah, thank you. Also, I just, I'm not very good looking at the text, but I just uh, took a look at, yeah, thanks to Chris for the, uh, for uh, some corrections. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know the uh, about the burning of the book. It's true that uh, the the first emperor did not burn divination text. So th- thanks for that correction. So so Yi Jing was not burned uh, by the first emperor. Now, although uh, I'm not sure, it may have been burned by Xiang Yu when he raided uh, Chang'an. So it, it may have been burned after all. But I, I'm not sure on that. But thank you for the for that note. And also, um, yeah, not diving. To, I'm sorry. Can I respond to what Jason just said? Oh yeah, please. About, about the Tao, if, uh, can you interpret the Tao as, as, uh, as uh, symbolizing or representing unchange? Because that would be a static Tao, would that, could that be, would you understand that Tao as being static, like uh, Plato's forms? <laughs> that that would be very interesting way to but but the, uh, the Tao yeah you can say it's unchanged right because Tao if you read the Laozi's Tao Te Ching 
the word 长, okay, which means unchanged or constant. Oh, really? It keep, yeah, it keeps showing up, right? They are looking for, for something unchanged, but but you are also right, right? Because it's keep changing, right? So uh, which means unchanged, like, uh, 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 let's say, uh, Parmenides, right? There's nothing changed, or just like uh, Heraclitus, everything keep changed. I don't know, just depend on which side you look at, just like, uh, I forget the name, the the the, the late the duck, uh, rabbit duck picture, uh, which side you want to see is the rabbit or duck, right? So I think that that's the uh, mystical part of uh, ancient philosophy. Yeah, that's what I mean, that the, uh, uh, isn't for Lao Tzu, uh, Tao is, is a mystery that can't be, can't be pinned down. And and say that, say what you know, what you can say about it, right? It's neither unchanged or changing. It's uh, it's something that you you can't really say, right? <laughs> okay, um, Joseph. Yeah, no, thank you for this. I actually, you know, the in just walking through this is that. Um, I see this as how we handle change um, and some of the, you know, consequences that, you know, that result um, that uh, from how, like, from our decisions. Um, and if we handle them uh, with uh, a certain, I guess, ethics, I guess, is a way of... Uh, determining whether something becomes a disaster or not. Um, and so, uh, and then that's, you know, I, I see in a way both the Tao and Confucius within this um, because the change is always ongoing, but Confucius is more about how you actually handle the change. That's the way I view it is like how you act in the world. Um, so that's just my interpretation, but this is very good. Uh, and I could see how you can continue to come back to this, to think about where you are in your life, uh, you know, where I am in my life, uh, as far as, um, you know, what to appreciate, not what not to appreciate and what's a disaster and what's not. And, um, so anyway, that's just my thought. Yeah, thank you. Very insightful. And uh, next, uh, I'm going to call on someone who hasn't spoken before, P P Peter Pipa. Hi, uh, I'm just um, thinking of the French phrase, um, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, which is uh, the more change, the more they stay the same. But can can you explain what the um you said this final row is different for this hexagram than for the other ones? They don't have it. Can you explain what that's about? I'll try. I don't know if I can. So yeah, of the 64, two of them are are special in this way. One is Qian and the other one is Quin. Quinn is the opposite of the Qian. Quinn, all six lines are the broken lines. So it's the pure yin, yin energy. And this one is the pure yang energy. Only these two have, uh, have, have this, this, this uh, use nine and for Quinn is use six. Well, the reason, the practical reason is when you do the divination, uh, basically you do the, think of it as a, a mathematical calculation. So the calculation at the end gives you two, two, two results. One that gives you all the six lines. The other one is it tells you which lines you should change. So change, you should switch. So if it's a yin, change it to yang. If it's a yang, change it to yin. So when you change those lines, it becomes a different hexagram. And you should interpret both, you should consider both hexagrams in your, 
interpretation of what the you know what the decision should be what the you know, what 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 uh, and what what the advice from the divination is and uh, also uh, sorry, go ahead. sorry does that mean it's purely practical there's no there's no philosophical content to the this i think it's both okay so so the, uh yeah so i'll, I'll finish the reason why these two these two all six symbols are the same, right? So in, in the rare occasion where you, in your calculation, all six lines change, then you, you use, you, you go to this, this last one says use nine uh, to, to make your uh, interpretation of the divination. But that's, so that's the practical reason why these two are special. Now the, but it's also, I think metaphysically, these two are of fundamental importance, right? These are the pure energies. And uh, basically heaven and earth, yin and yang, positive and negative. And uh, it's, uh, it's all, it, the, 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 the original writer is all offering an additional view on this. And uh, as I explained to me, it's, it's um, you look at this, it's from a perspective of looking at the symbol as a whole, not just at, in, 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 not just in, in the view of any particular position of in, inside the symbol. You're basically, you're, you're, you're outside the circle looking in. And this is why symbolic, you also say, you see, you know, see group of dragons, no head auspicious. So actually the, because of this question, I, I will invoke, um, Confucius, because uh, it's helpful. So that's his annotation on this uh, use nine. Okay, and this is uh, this is translation by. Uh, a German, uh, well-known German Yijin translator, I think his name is Wilhelm. Uh, when the creative, okay, so he translates Qian as, as cr the creative. When the creative, the great undergoes change in all the nines, the world is set in order. When the creative, the great undergoes change in all the nines, one perceives the law of heaven. Um, you know, the translation, in my opinion, is not great. So let me look at the Chinese. So basically, it's, to me, it, it means that when you, when you become like the, this, the, in, in, you're, you're in a position that's even above the top level you're at that position you've perfected uh let's just say your leadership that the says you know the world is in order in, in harmony and peace so there there's that's why i use the the quote from laozi that people don't even know you're existing anymore there's there's no there's no head anymore there's no leader anymore even though there may be a leader but people don't need to know that because things are just working. And um, so, so that's, that's my interpretation, but, but you know, <laughs> look, this, this is one person's opinion, which uh, don't, don't take it too seriously. <laughs> your interpretation, whatever you, your interpretation is, is, uh, is the right one for you. Thank you. Uh, Quan Li and then Madeline is what I see. Okay. So, well, I, I want to say at once that I have a weakness for your interpretation because uh, it, it has a link to the notion of Shu, okay, the 64 hex hexagrams representing 64 Shu. Uh, there are many translations for Shu, but uh, it can be uh, understood as a potential, a trend, or configurations of a situation. And 
uh, in my understanding, I think that we can explain 60, why there is 64 rather than 124 or 300, okay? And here is my hypothesis. You have two basic symbols, okay? Uh, the, the, the plain line and the broken line, okay? Yang and Yin. So you, uh, you have a base of two and a hexagram, is a diagram made by six lines, okay? So if you have all the permutation which are possible to exponent six, it gives 64. So that's why I think that the number of possibility of shu is 64 rather than any, num any other number. That's for one. And two, uh, I, I, I don't know if Jason would approve me, but I am a... <laughs> I am a, a fan of Wang Pi, okay? And you know that Wang Pi gave a certain interpretation of the Yi Ching in which each line uh, represents a certain advancement in the mind development, okay? So the, the, the top line, for example, represents the sage, okay? That sage could be Confucius, for example. And the fifth line represents the king or the person having the power, the authority. So. When uh, and and precisely, I think that it's there that is the value of the psychological and philosophical uh, meaning of the Yi Ching. Okay, and it's not only uh, it's it's more than a divination manual. It's a way to try to understand your psyche in a specific situation, and uh, from the hexagram or the shoe that you would get by by uh, the uh, by the yarrow stick or by uh, the coins, uh, you can have an interpretation into your psyche uh, depending of the social role or the position that you think that you you are in on the six lines and the other people in interactions with you. That's my comment. Thank you, thank you. Although, yeah, the 64, but you can always add another three lines, right? Then be like 512. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Madeline, uh, and then Jason, and then James. Let's see. Well, on that one where you had uh, all the different nines listed, plus one at the beginning, uh, it was a little further up. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'll get to it. Uh, right there. Yeah, that one. Uh, it looks to me um, almost as if the the group of dragons with no head could also be seen in a way as a submerged dragon. In other words, there's nothing there's nothing about it that stands out. It's not like the tallest poppy that gets its head cut off. Uh, so in that sense, it's almost like the um, that final line could be circling back to the initial lines. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's very innovative. I like it. You know, it goes in full circle. Because let's say you 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 take the analogy of this as, as like a person's career. Um, the initial line is like when you're when you're still a student. Uh, you know, you're you're not you're just staying quiet. You're investing in yourself. You're studying. You're making yourself better, more knowledgeable, and then you're emerging in the second line. And that's a good time to find mentors, the great people who can really enrich you even more, or show you more about uh, the field that that you're actually in. Uh, and then there's gonna be very often after your initial stage in the career, there comes a very, very stressful stage, right? That's when you're cautious, you're, you're keeping your energy up, not get distraught, and, uh, and you avoid disaster. <laughs> and, then, um, and then it comes to a point where, and I, I know this Chris uh, in the chat uh, was saying, this jump is not diving, it's jumping up. Uh, and I agree with that too. So, you know, you wanna, you wanna jump, Jump, get out of your comfort zone so you elevate yourself to the, to the next level. And don't be afraid, it's not gonna be a disaster. And then you get to, because of that, you get to a higher level. 
uh, in your enterprise. And uh, that's when also, when you're flying high, you should go and seek out wise people, uh, good people who can advise you. Uh, don't be, don't be close-minded. Don't be uh, too content with yourself. Uh, and then uh, oftentimes when people are at their heights, that's exactly when they things start crashing down. <laughs> that's uh, be very, very, uh, it's very much part of our philosophy uh, culture that when when you're high, uh, that's when you got to be the most careful, most, and and remind yourself the value of humility. And then you know this use nine is kind of like when you're retired. <laughs> when you're retired, there's no you, and if you've done things right, you've you you've left a good legacy, you have built a good system. You don't need this. You don't need a leader anymore. You, know, you can you can happily retire, and that's uh, like like you said, Madeline. That's that's when you're you're a submerged uh, dragon again, and uh, enjoying life. So that just anyway, I it's I don't take this too seriously. I'm just uh, kind of you know making a, maybe an in, inappropriate analogy, but I think right this thing is supposed to apply to to all different things in life. I think the author certainly intended that. So you can you can look at this from draw different analogies in life and, and look at it from different perspectives. Uh, Jason. Oh yeah, okay. And one one way well, today's discussion that remind me on the uh, last year or uh, two years, eh? 2021, we, we do the Dao De Jing uh, discussion, and then uh, uh, each. E each of the 81 uh, chapter, everyone can have a different kind of interpretation, doesn't matter what your background. And this one even more diverse than that, if we don't limit ourselves in the Confucian school uh, interpretation. So that's another interest part of reading uh, uh, I Jing. Uh, another way, one way I would suggest, and actually that's the way I read the, uh, uh, this this text. So if you look at these uh, six lines, right? So it's difficult to, ancient Chinese text is very difficult to read what's their, the writer's tone, okay? It's a descriptive or normative, right? So you don't know if it give you advice or uh, is it described on something, but if you look at this one, actually, I will read the first part as a description, and the second part is prescription. So first one, Qian Long Wu Yong, they describe the submerged or hidden dragon. Then they tell you, don't apply, don't do it, right? So each one you can see, you know, on the second part, either the first part is description, is a description, some natural phenomenon. Or you can interpret as if something happened. And the second part is give you the advice and or give you a prediction. Okay. The definition. Okay. It's it's a good sign or a bad sign. So uh so I think that's another way to read it and we'll get the tone uh uh uh, uh, uh something. And I think a lot of uh, ancient Chinese like to do this way. That's my theory. Oh uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, I agree with you. So Wu means yeah, is telling someone not to do something. So I I I changed my uh, uh, thank you. I, I changed my translation. It's submerged dragon. That's the situation. That's where you're at. And then here's the instruction: do not apply yourself. You know, do not do not uh, go out there yet. Um, and. For example, if we go to Confucius annotation. So nine at the beginning, hidden dragon do not act. What does this signify? The master said, this means a person who has the character of a dragon but remains concealed. He does not change to suit the outside world. He makes no name for himself. He withdraws from the world, yet is not sad about it. He receives no recognition, yet is not sad about it. 
If lucky, he carries out his principles. If unlucky, he withdraws with them. Verily, he cannot be uprooted. He is a hidden dragon. Hidden dragon do not act. The reason is that he is below. Uh, in another annotation, hidden dragon do not act. The power of the light principle is still covered up and concealed. The superior man acts in accordance with the character that has become perfected within him. This is a way of life that can submit to scrutiny on any day. Being hidden means that he's still in concealment and not given recognition, that if he should act, he would not yet, not as yet accomplish anything. In this case, the superior man does not act. So does each of the readings that you get when you uh, um, do the reading um, and get a hexagram, it, it offers you, it, it gives you a, um, a uh, statement about where the nine, where the, uh, where the dragon is? Uh, when you do the divination, yeah. it's a very complicated thing. So, you okay let's say yeah you get this after your computation your results is this this symbol the qian uh -huh. and then as another part of the another result of your computation is it tells you which lines you should change change uh it, it can be anywhere from zero to six lines that that you need to change so let's say it tells you the change your results tells you to change only one line. Let's say the second line. And uh, so when you change the second line, it becomes a different symbol. Uh, and then you, you, you read, and then also the line that changes is, is, is the situation, the most relevant one. But of course your computation could very well come up with multiple lines that you change. So all of them are, are equally relevant. And then you read all of those and you, you draw a conclusion. You put, you, you, you analyze the text, the relevant text, and then you have to summarize in your own mind what the, what the, what the, what the outcome, what, 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 the, what the advice from the div divination is. So I really think it's actually a clever way by the ancients to tell you to analyze things from different perspectives and then draw a conclusion. It forces you to look at, so divination uh, for, with e. Jean is used for major decisions when, and it's only used as a kind of a last resort. When you, when you analyze this situation, it's just not clear what to do, what's the right decision. And then you do the divination and then basically the process itself uh, makes you to ritually to um, be very meditative, first of all. And then you are forced by the process to look at this, um, this problem that you may, you're facing, this dilemma from different perspectives, different angles. And then, and, then, and then in your own mind, draw your conclusion about what the best decision is. That's my that's my view. Some, yeah, of course, there are others believe that there's actually you know real supernatural power in this. But uh, that's. Uh, uh, could you explain what the 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 nine is supposed to mean? Because does nine represent the dragon, or the nine symbolize what does the number nine mean? Okay, so in the Yi Jin system. Uh, Odd numbers are young because odd is actually, odd numbers are the numbers of numbers of birth. 
uh, and the the even numbers are in the uh, the even numbers are numbers of completion. So when when things are are paired up, that's 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 completion. So that's why the even numbers, the multiples of two, are are uh, the numbers some uh, of completion symbolizing com completion, and they they they're associated with the yin energy. And the yang is because now you're no longer complete. So, so right, you have three, let's say three, three is an odd number. So you already have two, that's complete. And then now you have one more. So that symbolizes birth, giving rise to new things. And that's a yang energy. And from the numbers one to 10, nine is the, the largest yang number. So that's why it was believed why the author used nine to write, to refer to the young symbol. Okay, nine represents young. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Madeline. Okay, there we go. Uh, so still back on that one I was on before, the one where you had all the different lines. Uh, why, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm thinking about the, the internal logic or structure of it as a poem. Uh, and what it reads like to me is, um, it's a narrative, and it's a narrative about a particular type of energy and a type of energy cycle. Um, it has to do with sun, water, agriculture, and uh, so as a particular type of energy cycle of starting low, rising, and then becoming humble again in a way uh, before the uh, before the sun makes the air rise again, uh, human beings, a type of human activity would be one example of that and someone's career would be an example of that. So that's the, the divination part. And then there's also that underlying philosophy part of, of more of an energy cycle and the fundamental natural things it pertains to. Along those lines, uh, Chris had put something very interesting in chat. Uh, where you have fourth nine perhaps jump into the deep body of water uh, he had put in the suggested the word leap like to leap mm -hmm. up from and i'm just wondering what it says literally uh, because certainly to leap up would make more sense you have the submerged dragon now he's up on the field now he's kind of you know virtuous and cautious then he jumps up, then he's flying in the sky, then he has regrets, and now he has no head. Yeah, I think Chris's uh, translation is better, is leap. Yeah, the, the, the word, uh, the character Yue is, is um, like a very energetic kind of jump. Okay, and so it could be jump, something like jump deep body of water could mean jumping out of it. Or as if you were jumping yeah. out of a deep body of water yeah. into the sky. Yeah, it's that's an interesting uh, question because yeah, the in the original text the preposition is okay. I'll, I'll translate it literally. Maybe leap at uh, deep body of water. So the preposition is at. So okay. take it as you, you will. Yeah, it could, yeah, it could very well mean that. It doesn't, the preposition is not into. So, so yeah, I, I admit, I, uh, I haven't thought about this enough. So when I, when I did my translation real quick, uh, so into is, is not what the text says, it's at. So what, what does leap at something mean? I, I don't know. Also, you know, uh, classical Chinese can be pretty vague, so, yeah. Could it, uh, could it relate to that, um, to that story about the, um, 
the giant fish and the phoenix. Which which story is that? Uh, I'm trying to remember if it's from Autumn Floods or oh 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 yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah Trons is uh yeah uh Xiao Yao Yao. Um, Yeah, it's just the it's the uh, deep it's the submerged and then also the flying that's just I'm just kind of free associating. Well, I'm sure Johnson Johnson was very well versed in eating and probably his writing style, his stories. I, I would not be surprised at all if he was inspired by this. Yeah. Now, whether the philosophy is connected. Maybe uh, it's not a simple connection that one can just draw a line, but um, but Zhuangzi was talking about how to live a life where you feel free. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It, it takes more thinking, but possibly, yeah. Uh, Quan Li, and then Jason. Yes. What 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 is your explanation? between the Fusi order, what would be the meaningful difference between the Fusi order and the King One order of the Trigrads? Oh, the Xian Tian and Hou Tian. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah, I'll have to, I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm not expert enough. I, I've read, you know, I can repeat some what ancient scholars have said, which I'm sure probably already know. And I, I can't really recall part, part what, what me, I hear, I, but- I'm supposed to put in an exclamation point or something, but I could I could answer the question. The Fuxi order traditionally is the binary order. So it's Xiaoyong from the Song Dynasty created a, an arrangement of the hexagrams that are in fact binary order of the hexagram and has become known as the Fu Xi order. Uh, the King Wen uh, order we don't know goes back to King Wen, but it goes back at least to, I wanna say Han Dynasty, but it, 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 at least Han or uh, uh, close to it. Uh, so the, the, the traditional, you know, one everyone has learned over the centuries is the, the Wen Wang, the uh, Wen arrangement. I, although different from modern versions, it's traditionally with Qian in the upper right corner going left and then down the chart. So, you know, modern things get it backwards. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a great summary, succinct and good summary. So I've always liked uh, what I think is the Xian Tian where because mathematically it's symmetric and makes more sense to me, but not just. Yeah. Well, that's that's the traditional explanation that the Xian Tian is uh, symbolizing a state of balance of equilibrium. Uh, but uh, uh, and I, thanks to Chris for the historical explanation because um, the uh, the King One explanation seems to be more dynamic. Is it related because? The Yi Ching for me has at least three layers, okay? Uh, the agricultural astronomical layer, the magical divination layer, and the psychological philosophical layer. And since historically, the King Wen order seems to be before the Xiaoyong creation in, in, under the Sun Dynasty with, uh, of the uh, Fuxi order, uh, might it be related to a kind of representation of the seasons, for example? I, I think we're getting two things conflated because I'm talking about the Fuji order of the 64 hexagrams, not early heaven, later heaven trigrams. That's a whole okay. different wall of wax. Okay. This is just okay. Xiaoyong's Fuji, it's known as the Fuji sequence in, in, uh, in uh, comparison to the, the Wenwang sequence. And the only other one I'm yeah, familiar right. with is the, the Ma Wang Dui uh, family sequence, which I think is fantastic, actually. Yeah. But in the translation by Richard Willem, the uh, Fusi order is explained as a state of equilibrium, and the other one has been a state of dy dynamism. Dynamism of what? Of uh, 
the astronomical agricultural phenomenon or of the psychological phenomenon? I suppose that we can give an interpretation in both domains. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll confess I, I, I was I've never been much interested in the orders because uh, there's so many different ones. Uh, Lian Shan, I, I talked about the three e versions of each in, in ancient times, the two that were lost, but uh, seems like we do know that they had different orders also from the Zhou Yi. Lian Shan started with a symbol for a mountain and I forget what Gui Tang started with. And then, the other one and then cool. through, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. The, the other one was Kun. Kun uh, one was earth, one was mountain, and uh -huh. then Zhou Yi. Yeah, and then uh, throughout history, scholars as as late as Qing Dynasty, they they uh, many of them came up with their own orders. Um, so to me, you know, it's things are dynamic, and it, there's no beginning and end anyway. So why, I I, I don't know what's the point of. Uh, maybe maybe it's the right answer. Maybe it's only the personal choice of each one. I, I mm -hmm. don't reject that possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jason and James. Uh, yeah, Pin, can you go back to the uh, the six lines? Uh, uh, I, I can, mm -hmm. no, uh, the, the yeah, one yeah, yeah. main text, yeah. I kind of like to, uh, yeah, this one, yeah. So to answer the uh, the nine four, right? The four, the four slide, Four nine, right? Right, so, right. Okay, one way to I, I will read this one. The word hoard, I think it means sometimes, right? So sometimes the dragon jump out the uh, 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 a lake. Okay, that that's no disaster. I think that's another way to read it, the hoard in the uh mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, hoard is like a probabilistic thing it could mean maybe but i agree it could also mean sometimes like a statistical occurrence yeah <laughs> uh james and then chris so the first uh six lines um they're all like um you know uh, nines right so they're does that mean that the, that's the, maybe the beginning of life itself, the beginning of the day, or at least the beginning of the day, right? So we'd be like the um, the origin of of life itself, beginning with the uh, with this um, dragon-like energy, right? And then it uh, integrates with the other other eight uh, other eight hexagrams or other seven seven, right? Uh, or with the uh, with the broken line representing the male and the female. Right? Yeah, you're right. I believe, okay. So traditionally the day uh, on the Chinese clock was uh, divided into 12 divisions. And um, I think the most young and, and, and there's correspondence between the divisions and, 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 and particular uh, hexagrams. And I think the most young time, which would be this Qian, symbol is um, around, right around sunrise. That's mm -hmm. uh, when young, so young, the, the sun, when the beginning of the sun, the, the emergence, that's where actually the, the young energy is at its maximum. Right. And yeah. And then the, uh, the broken lines would represent the, uh, maybe the evening, uh, the nighttime. Uh, you know, the the all broken lines, uh, yeah, will be uh, the beginning of night. That's right, okay. the, in the so, evening, around dusk. Yeah. Would the broken lines uh, be represented by the number six? Are they, is that is yeah. six the opposite of nine? Six, yeah, six uh, opposite of nine. And um, that's, I think, because, you know, it's hard to explain these choices that someone made 3,000 years ago, but uh, I believe six, was chosen because six, you know, there's six lines and then six is the biggest odd number from one to six. Okay. Uh, you know. um, okay, I believe Chris 
It's next yeah, in line. I wanted to step in. If I could explain that system, because I started out divining a long, long time ago. And this is, has to do with ancient divination. Six, seven, eight, and nine are the numbers you see in uh, divination, modern period anyway, uh, from uh, Joe onwards. There's other stuff before, but uh, six is a changing yin, uh, nine is a changing yang, which is why you, you see this okay. in here. And uh, seven and eight are unchanging yang, unchanging yin. Okay. So when you get a hexagram, it will say uh, six in the fourth place. That means it's the yin line in the fourth place that changes into a yang. And obviously, you know, as you're going through them, if you're reading that line, that's a changing line. So they all have sixes and nines. But in the full system, it's six, seven, eight, nine. And that's what you work with in divination. The Yarostocks produce the same six, seven, eight, nine. The coins produce it, whatever, whatever you use. Thank you, Chris. Um, the other thing I, I had was just, just a, a, a wild question because I know none of you guys have read a huge amount of Chinese uh, literature and I'm trying to figure out where this came from and it has to do with the dragons in the lakes. I read when I was a kid, when I was 14, 15, when I was digging around in the, the Liji and things like that, that when the thunderstorm, the first thunderstorm of the year that was supposed to be predicted by the imperial diviners when it was late, for which they could be executed, by the way, they would encourage the dragons to come out of the lakes by throwing iron ingots into the lakes, which I would think would be a great thing for a chemist to explain, you know, does that actually cause thunderstorms to arise in that particular climate com you know, thing, or was it just a superstition or what? But have you ever heard of that wild story? And if so, you know, where, where the heck did it come from? Or I, I'm just imagining things from when I was a kid. I, I have not, and you mentioned no. Li Ji, that would be a, not a bad guess, because Li Ji is, boy, it, it, it records so many details of rituals and yeah, these ancient practices, yeah, so. All over it. I can't find that, those dang dingus. Maybe I was reading Minhum. Uh He has a lot of stuff like that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry, I can't, can't help you out there. Have. All right, well, anyway, that's all I have. <laughs> uh, Joseph. Um, really quickly, I was just thinking about this, uh, perhaps jump into a deep body of water, no disaster, and this idea of um, pushing yourself beyond the limits. But in, in, I'm asking it. What I'm asking is: Is the dragon seen as a creative force? Yes. So that's so basically this entire so this section can be seen as like the dragon being something that is uh, bringing something new into existence. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, yeah. like let me go back to this slide. So Chen, the character itself, is. If you go into the original pictograph, it symbolizes you know the sun, the rising sun, and the also has this plant, which also you know embodies growth, and the rising air. So this is the it the whole thing right symbolizes things that are rising and growing, and also the the nourishment and and power energy from the sun, and it's. The morning, so morning is this, the beginning, you know, things are emerging. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, oh, Chris, yes. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to supplement that by saying, in fact, a lot of people, and I think it includes Wilhelm, uh, translate uh, Chem, the, the hexagram we're, we're looking at as the creative and Kun, the, the earth, as the receptive. Uh, interesting thing in the Han Dynasty, Yijing on Silk, uh, those are called the key and the flow, which is really cool alternative. Uh, a lot of the text of that e is identical, but a few things like that are, are really wild. Uh, so 
there, I think there is a lot of interest in this fourth line about leaping in the in the deep lake. So let's just see what Chi Confucius says. Uh, sorry, I need to move some of these boxes around <laughs> on my screen. Nine in the fourth place means wavering flight over the depths, no blame. What does this signify? The master said, in absence, in, in ascent or descent, there is no fixed rule, except that one must do nothing evil. In advance or retreat, no sustained perseverance avails, except that one must not depart from one's nature. The superior man fosters his character and labors at his task in order to do everything at the right time. Therefore, he makes no mistake. Wavering flight over the depths, he tests his powers. Wavering flight over the depths, here the way of the creative is about to transform itself. The nine in the fourth place is too rigid and not moderate. It is not yet in the heavens above, neither is it any longer in the field below, nor in the middle regions of the human. Therefore it is said, wavering flight. To waver means that no one, that one has freedom of choice. Therefore one makes no mistake. So I don't know, the translation is kind of turbid and not, not real accurate in my opinion. So what- uh, It's James Leg. I recognized it immediately. Yeah. Um, so what, what Confucius said, you know, the, the one, the pers you know, it's interesting that Confucius, you know, well, I shouldn't say Confucius, the, the Ten Wings offer like many different interpretations of the same thing. Uh, so I, I find that, you know, I think it's a good thing. That's basically number one, it tells us there's no right, one right interpretation. So what I like, to me, the, the one that, the, the, the annotation that's uh, resum or easiest for me to understand is, uh, that you're testing yourself. That's what this text says. Uh, this translation said, test his powers, but really the original test just says, you're testing yourself. So that's why I think it's, it's about you know getting out of your comfort zone. You you've you've been learning. You've been talked to the great people. At some point, you have to move up, move forward, where you have to you know stretch yourself a bit and test yourself. So uh, and then I like this part that says basically you're in the situation. You're kind of in the middle. You know you're not low. You're not high. So this is a time to be to be flexible and when, when there are opportunities, like uh, Jason said, go, 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 and, uh, go and make a leap. Yeah. So that, that's what I think. Uh, Madeline. Well, I love this image of the waver in flight. It uh -huh. reminds me of the, uh, there's a boundary, a, bound, a sort of turbulent boundary layer between air and water on the microscopic level. Mm -hmm. uh, so anywhere you see even the surface of a calm puddle or um, the surface of the ocean, any surface where water and air meet, on the microscopic level, the molecules are constantly mixing right at that point. Mm -hmm. And that's what the wavering flight reminded me of. And yet, because it's between air and water over the waver, it's flight, but it's over the depths. On the other hand, it says it's too rigid, maybe too young and not moderate. Um, so it hasn't, it hasn't settled. Um, and then in all the discussions about uh, whether the Chinese philosophers are con concerned themselves with free will, uh, I think we have some going on right here. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. The sorry, I was a little distracted. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I great interpretations. Always uh, and a lot of innovative thoughts. So uh, 
I just noticed the time. It's uh, at uh, a few minutes past the hour. So I'm afraid I need to join my family and defend ourselves from the year monster. Because uh, yeah. it's, it's almost nightfall here. And so, so, you know, he might be on his way. <laughs> so thanks. Happy New Year. Thank you, thank you Pin. And uh, I think you want to, uh, right now it's your time uh, six, right? Oh, no, 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 still uh, four. So you get ready for the uh, Chinese New Year Eve dinner. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks, thank you, Happy New Year. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a good way to you, uh, celebrate. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Jason. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. 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 Thank you.